Dave Chesson is one of my all-time favorite guests, and I'm so happy to have him back. Hello, April Cox here. I am so excited to have a special guest speaker with us today. His name is Dave Chesson, and he is the founder of Kindlepreneur.com. He's somebody that I've looked up to for a long time and modeled a lot of the things that I do for other authors based on the stuff that I've seen him doing. He has inspired me through all of what he does for authors, the articles, the feedback, the interviews that he does, his podcast, all the free resources, AMS ad training, everything that you can get as an author through his website and all of the great knowledge that he drops. So it has been a huge encouragement to me and a great example for me to follow. And I am so happy to have him here today. Thank you. It's so, funny you say the inspired thing. I'm actually wearing a t-shirt that says that. Stay, stay inspired. inspired. <laughs> I'll just provide a little brief intro. You are a doting dad with two amazing kids, all about family, ex-military, a bit of a geek, which I absolutely love because I am a propeller head myself loves Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and loves self-publishing and writing and creating books and tools. So tell us a little bit of something that we don't know about you. Sure. Well, there's actually two parts. First and foremost, I have dyslexia, which is one of the reasons why I really focused on understanding the market just a little bit better. I've never been gifted in the ability to just sit down and write anything I can think of and people enjoy it. I remember uh, being in high school and my English teacher had us like have some assignment about writing some life event and my dog had just passed away. And so I thought this is that moment that emotions are going to come, you know, through my fingertips and I'm going to be able to write something and I'm going to finally get an A too. Not that I'm using my dog's death to improve my grade, but that being said, I thought this was it. I feel passionate about something and yeah, no, I was a D minus. Um, <laughs> so I've always struggled with writing. And so that's why for me, if I was going to spend all that time really focusing on a book and trying to put something together, I wanted to understand what it was that people wanted to hear about, or how could I change the message that I had that would fit an existing market. And so that's really what kickstarted this entire thing. A second thing is I have three kids. My oldest daughter, though, is 21. And she's off in college. She's uh, doing her senior year at Lehigh University. She's an all star softball player ranked habitually in the top 10 for many categories in NCAA softball D1. So really nice. proud dad moment get to go see her play softball all the time. Anybody who's Facebook friends with me, I always apologize come February because I then say my Facebook page is now Jalen stat page. <laughs> you know, <in> video, so. <laughs> I love it. But yeah, so those are just kind of two of the other things. I did the military. I was a submariner, did nuclear engineering, then transferred into military diplomacy. I did a lot in South Asia and East Asia, a lot of incredible fun events, I guess is the best way to put it. And <laughs> now I get to be home full time with my kiddos on uh, writing and being able to jump on like things like this. So that's wonderful. We're so glad that you do. So let's start with just kind of some general questions. What are the most important things that an author needs to do to ensure their books get discovered, but exactly what you were talking about. Yeah. So, you know, Amazon is one of the world's largest book markets and people generally are now thinking Amazon first instead of any other store. So they'll go to Amazon and they will start looking for the kind of books that they want to see. They go to the search bar. Maybe they're typing in a recommendation that a friend had. Maybe there's a category that they really love. Like I'm a diehard lit RPG cultivation fan. And by the way, there's a, over 14,000 categories on Amazon. So something like lit RPG cultivation is actually, you know, in existence. And so people have their way of finding what it is they want. And Amazon uses your information about your book to kind of help figure out what book to show. Let's face it, if people continue to go to Amazon and typed in, we'll say, going back to school children's book, and Amazon constantly presented, say, get your GED or college prep books or, you know, erotica or something just completely off, all of a sudden people would stop using the store. And so it's really important for Amazon to get that right, because we have trust that Amazon's going to be efficient and effective, and it's going to save me time. The moment they stop doing that is the moment that they're going to lose mass market, and it's going to open up an opportunity for Walmart and all these other stores that would love to gain that, that advantage, or Barnes & Noble for that matter. So you have to understand that as a store, they really need to do their best 
to show the right product. Now, the interesting thing about this is that we have to remember that Amazon is not a human. Now, I, I know that sound, you're like, duh, Dave, but I'm going to keep saying this phrase because I think it will help us to understand why Amazon does what it does. Amazon needs calculations. It needs a program, an algorithm, lots of algorithms to help them make the right decision instantaneously. So they need input. They can't read your book like literally and come up and say, oh, I got it. This is clearly a book that does X, Y, and Z. Now there's some factors that they can pull from your book. That's true. But they need you as the author to help them kind of fill in the rest of the context, okay? And when you give them that information and it fits with where there are openings, your book is the thing they'll start to present. So these are really key parts. And the last part that I'm going to bring up too, to give an understanding of the Amazon store is Amazon also wants to make as much money as it can. They are all about finding, tweaking, changing things to increase their bottom line. And so one of the other things that really comes into factor is that sometimes Amazon makes decisions because even though maybe this particular book is a better fit for that search, when people do that search, they end up buying this other book instead. And so therefore, that means to Amazon that that book converts better. So all of these are kind of a, shall we say, kind of a big picture understanding on how Amazon works. And to recap on that is shoppers have different ways of looking for books. Amazon wants to present them with the best options so that they keep coming back and use the store. But Amazon also wants to make sure that they're making the most money. So they'll optimize it for more sales. So generally, you talked about those fields that get indexed by Amazon and that the ways that they learn about our book. So we're talking about title, subtitle, categories we choose, and those seven keywords. Are those all treated equally? The description matter? Where do we really focus our attention if we want to make sure that we're getting noticed and indexed by Amazon? The three biggest ways that Amazon uses, or the three biggest parts, right, to get the most information is your title, your subtitle, and your seven Kindle keyword boxes. The reason why these are important is because it's crucial that if somebody types in the title of your book, right, that's probably the best search result is to show your book. On top of that too, it's probably the best conversion. So again, going back to what we just talked about and implying that, that's why the title is so important. And I say title and subtitle because I know kind of being under the hood on programming wise, Amazon doesn't separate a title and subtitle as a data unit. So that tells me that Amazon sees title and subtitles one thing. So I like to say that the title and subtitle is just as important. So if you as a writer are like, well, I have this amazing title and I don't want to put keywords or certain phrases in there. Cool. Do that. But then explain it a bit in your subtitle. For example, so I talked about lit RPG, right? And that's literature role-playing games. That's usually some kind of book where the person's stuck inside a video game of some sort, you know, or they're leveling up their character. When I type in lit RPG cultivation, how am I supposed to know from the cover that that kind of fantasy book is exactly that, right? Instead, though, I don't want somebody to title their book lit RPG cultivation adventure, because that just sounds so dumb. You know, that doesn't sound right, you know. But what I love to see as a shopper is that the person explains to me in the subtitle that it's an epic lit RPG cultivation adventure novel. Now I know for sure, okay, got it. This is truly what I'm looking for. So it's really good to use that subtitle to really help to explain what kind of genre this is specifically, or in, in nonfiction, you know, the pain point, the result, and who this is for, okay? These are all really help me to secure. So that'll help in the conversions, and that will help with telling Amazon what this book or who this book should be presented in front of. And the last one is the seven Kindle keyword boxes. And that's your ability to tell Amazon straight up, all right, this really is this kind of book. This is the kind of characters. This is kind of, you know, a plot theme. Like all of those aspects are really good fiction category keywords, if you will, keywords groupings. Or a nonfiction, this is the pain point, the results, the agitators, the demographic, this is who this book is for. And so Amazon uses those three main inputs to kind of help figure out, okay, not only where should we put this, but also it would help with getting the right shopper to find your book. And I say that, I know that those two statements kind of sounded the same, but let me explain that a little bit. Amazon may put your book in front of something. But if that's not the right shopper, right? The shopper's going to see your book and they're not going to buy it. So mm -hmm. making sure that you truly fit the fit that. I've seen mystery novels get put in there for mystery, but what they really were was like dark, 
gruesome murder type things. And so people would show up thinking it was a nice mystery novel and they would read and be like, whoa, and give them like a one star for the heinous murder scene that opened the first chapter, right? So again, it's about getting your book in front of people, but making sure you're in front of the right people. Right. So we just said that the three biggest ones are title, subtitle, and keywords. I would say the next one is the selection of your categories. That's like the strongest indication of, hey, my book truly fits in this area, okay? It has elements of this, this, and this because I want to be next to those books. Mm -hmm. After that, it's really kind of a combination of a lot of smaller factors. I know that Amazon indexes the author's name because if I type in your name, I hope that they show your books. They also do use certain words inside of your book description. By the way, it's not that Amazon indexes the entire book description, okay? They don't go through and find every phrase or every sentence. But what they do do is they say, well, hmm, this person says that this is a science fiction book. And they said all these science fiction kind of words as their keywords. And they also chose science fiction categories. Well, okay, if this is a science fiction book, it should be using science fiction type words to describe itself in the book description. And so it looks for things like intergalactic, you know, and epic space battles and battle cruisers and, you know, ion flux and all these other really cool science fiction terms. And so it then uses those particular words in your book description to help it to figure out Yep. Okay. Yep. This is really a science fiction book. And yep. Okay. This makes sense. So they do that. They also use the words that reviewers use. And there are a couple of others. So those are kind of the three main groups, the three we talked about the categories, and then all the kind of little tertiary ones. So one of the things that I picked up on early on when you were talking about subtitle and how Amazon uses it is that if somebody leaves that blank, they're missing out on a huge opportunity for keywords. Oh yeah, absolutely. There is an example that I love to show people. It's a book called Hitch, H-I-T-C-H. And the cover shows what looks like it's nighttime. And I think you're looking at a cowboy from, from behind. He's on his horse and he's looking up into the sky and there seems to be fireworks or ramparts, you know, or something, something going on there. There's no subtitle. You would have no idea what the book is about. And by the way, I say cowboy because I think it is, but apparently it was a uh, civil war. So I was even in the wrong time period and it was ramparts, but apparently they used uh, fireworks or something and, or maybe it's the other way around, but here's the thing with the market. If you confuse, you lose. And it is some kind of Western romance book. But if I typed in Western romance and this book showed up at the top, I would look at the cover and I'd have no idea what time period setting. I couldn't tell you what the book is about. There's no idea. And the title is just hitch. Mm -hmm. So the only way I'm going to discover what this book is about and if it fits what I want is by clicking on it and reading the book description. But here's the thing. Amazon shoppers, we're all lazy. It's so much easier to scroll down and look for the one that actually fits, right? I'm not going to click on every individual book that Amazon presented to me. What I'm going to do is click on the book that I think fits what I'm really looking for. And so Hitch probably lost out on a lot of customers. Now, here is one other thing. The author of that book is famous, uh, apparently, for a certain style of book. They Clearly, from the reviews, there's a lot of people who have read it. But people who do not know the author would never know what kind of book that is. And so I think that author, even though they're famous, are losing out on a lot of new customers and new sales just because it's unclear. And so one of the things to marketing is, I always like to say is if you confuse, you lose. People are just quicker to scroll down a little bit further and look for the next book that actually fits what they perceive to be the kind of book they're looking for. Right. Thank you. That's really helpful. Let's kind of switch gears to the seven keyword phrases that we talked about. There are so many conflicting recommendations out there. Do you keyword stuff? Do you not keyword stuff? Is it just one long phrase that you're trying to find the best possible, you know, high frequency searches, low competition? And then I heard someone else say, no, for your seven keywords, you want really popular phrases because then Amazon's going to know what to do with your book. But that doesn't sit right with me either. So there's so much confusion about how to use these keywords. Could you expand on that a little bit for us? Yeah, absolutely. So we did an experiment uh, about a year and a half ago to try to lay this 
question to rest. And if you want to know how we did the, the experiment, I've got it written out. If you just Google seven Kindle keywords, that, that article will come up and it will lay out the ex exact experimentation, how we did it. And then also it will reaffirm everything I'm about to say from our results. But here is the short and simple answer to that. So there's the seven boxes and each of the boxes allows you 50 characters inside of it. A character is a space, a letter, a symbol, whatever it is, right? So the question is, is do I fit as many words in there or not? Or do I make them very particular phrases and be done with it? And the answer is both. You see, what we found in the experiment is that, say, for example, you put five random words in there, like dog, kids book, puppies, school. Amazon looks at that. And what they do is they use all the different arrangements of those words. So it could be puppy school, could be dog puppy, it could be children's book puppy, puppy children's book. And also pluralizations as well. So puppies, puppy, and they will index your book and show your book for those different phrases. If that's a phrase they would actually entertain. Okay. So like puppy dog, or maybe dog puppy, we'll go with that one. If you type in maybe dog puppy in Amazon, it may come back and be like, yeah, no, we're not going to show anything. That, that doesn't mean that there isn't a book that used that word. It's just, they've acknowledged that that's a search that they're not going to entertain. But any of those combinations of words that they would entertain and yes, show a result for you will index for it. So this would lead most people to say, well, then I should stuff as many words into to the boxes as possible. But on the counter side, we found out that if you have a particular phrase, okay, you know, and a phrase is like, you know, maybe it's puppy school for kids. All right. Maybe you did your research and you found out that that is a great term. People are typing it into Amazon. It's low competition. And you really, really want to be in front of it because it is a children's book about puppy school, you know? All the little puppies go into school and it's, you know, for ages six to nine or something like that. I would say that it is important that you only use that phrase and that phrase alone inside of one of your seven boxes, because when you do that and there are no other words inside of it, and that is a perfect fit, Amazon will not only index you for it, but they'll rank you higher for it because you're much more clear about what it is you want. So having as many words in there benefits you by getting you in front of more things. But having a specific phrase you care about most being the only thing in the box gets you better rankings. So my answer to people is I usually recommend that you should do your research. And if you find three to four phrases that you absolutely love that really get searched for that people are, you know, that that's a good fit for your book, then I would just put that phrase in one of the boxes and a phrase in another box however many of those are. And that's it. I would not fill it up with anything else. But for the remainder three or four, Okay, depending on whether you selected three or four in the first part, the remainder, I would stuff as many of the words that pertain to your book that you came up with that are a great description or have the potential to be good searches. And that way I see that you get the best of both worlds. You rank better for the ones you care about most and you index for more than if you hadn't grouped them all together. So does anything come into play like long tail versus shorter keyword phrases? Does that matter? Should we be looking for more long tail? Yes. Keyword phrases for those boxes? Absolutely. Long tail. So for those who might not know that term, long tail is a more descriptive phrase, right? So here's what I like to tell people is we've been analyzing the shoppers on Amazon and how they respond. And what we find is, especially for those who aren't like super hardcore avid readers, like let's face it, I've read enough lit RPG cultivation books that I know immediately when I show up to Amazon, I type in lit RPG cultivation dungeon, and it usually provides me with the kind of books I like to read. So I already know what I'm going to look for. But the majority of Amazon shoppers aren't like that. And what they will do is they'll go in and they'll say, all right, fantasy book. And then they look and they see the list of all the books that Amazon presented. Now, what are the chances that Amazon is able to present the exact kind of fantasy book that I like? So most shoppers, instead of erasing what they did or giving up or whatever, or clicking page after page after page to look at them, they'll say, okay, well, I like epic books like Lord of the Rings. So maybe epic elves. And so they'll add that term like epic and elves to it and then hit search and then they'll see the list and okay i don't know too many of these look gruesome so maybe i need to put a word in there that that turns it to lighthearted, or maybe I'm, I'm a child or i'm younger and i want a young adult so i'll then add young adult to it and so all of a sudden i finally find exact kind of books i want when i start to see fantasy book epic 
elves, young adult. Mm -hmm. And it's funny is, is that those phrases get searched a lot. Like a lot of people end up on this path. And what's really neat about those terms is that they really are very particular. If I showed up number one for fantasy book, most people that type it in would not like my fantasy book or say, this is the one. But if they typed in, and I'm just making this up here, but if they typed in fantasy book, epic elf, young adult, and that's exactly what I am. It's about elves. They're young adult. You know, it's it's meant for children. It's got the right cover that fits them. A majority of the people that type that in will probably select my book, especially if I rank number one for the search results. So I think that the long tail terms are much more important. You might say, well, more people search for fantasy book than, you know, fantasy book, epic elf. I got to come up with another one. I can't remember right. them all. <laughs> um, but I would say I'd probably make more sales from that long tail term than I would from the broad term. I would absolutely love to rank number one for Lit RPG Cultivation Dungeon. I'm pretty sure I'd make more sales if I ranked number one for that than if I ranked Fantasy Lit RPG. So long tail keywords is not just about your Amazon ads. It's about those seven keyword boxes as well. I think that's good for us to understand. And one of the key features that I love with Rocket is the ability to find low competition categories. Does it shoot us in the foot if we do a lot of low competition categories that maybe have something to do with our book and maybe we'll rank higher and we'll have a better chance of getting that bestseller badge. Like for example, my book is Little Labradoodle series. It's about dogs. It's about social, emotional learning, things like that. But there's a lot of aspects to it that I could choose categories that are much less competitive than certainly dogs, right? Mm -hmm. So when I'm thinking about categories, does low competition and the ranking, is that something that I should primarily search for? Do you use a combination of strategies for picking the categories? Yeah, we get to choose at least 10 or mm -hmm. up to 10. And here, here's the thing about the category thing. Technically, Amazon has no limit for the number of categories you can be a part of. That being said, I've never had the humans, and I, I will say this, if you've ever dealt with Amazon, you'll know when you're dealing with humans because they're never on the same page with each other. But when dealing with the humans, I've never had a human say no to 10 or less categories. I have had humans say no to greater than 10, and I've had humans who are like, yeah, sure, and it's been 20 plus. Sometimes when you're asking for your categories, just understand you might ju have just gotten the wrong human. By the way, they have a form that you can fill out that sole purpose is for adding and changing your categories. And so I filled out that form once and one of the humans came back and said, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to request what categories you're a part of. So, I mean, I really mean it when I say the humans, not always on the same page. So just to caveat that, I always say 10 is about the sweet spot for you, okay? And I do not think that... If you select, say, maybe your fiction book and you're selecting nonfiction, that may hurt you because that may throw off Amazon and be like, whoa, wait a second. So we shouldn't show this to entertainment, you know, for, for fiction type things because this is clearly nonfiction. I think that kind of differentiation would hurt you for sure. That's massive. It might be a book on how to write fiction, right? And you may have fiction words as your keywords, but the fact that you've chosen nonfiction immediately tells Amazon this is a learning book and not an entertainment book. That is an example where I think there's a major importance. Now, if say, for example, again, I'm going to say it to you guys as, you know, as authors, it's up to your decision on your reputation, okay, and what you believe is right. But just like a couple of years ago or so, Harry Potter came under fire because they were ranking number one in orphan books. And I mean, okay, Harry Potter was an orphan, but really, like, that's... Why'd you guys target that? You know, I mean, that's kind of up to you. I would say for me personally, I really tried to look for five categories that give my book the best chance to rank, you know, number one and five categories that I'm like, this is the absolute best fit category there is. I think that that kind of approach to it gives me the best of all worlds. And I'm just saying, don't do something that's completely opposite of what your book is just because it's so easy to get number one. I've seen a lot of spammers out there who they come out with this book on like dieting, but they found this IT technology category where if you sell one book, you'll be the bestseller. So they made that their thing just so they could say their diet book is a bestseller. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that. So 
the reason why I recommend five and five is two things. Number one, to go after categories where you have the best chance of, of hitting number one, especially habitually, is really, really good. Uh, that really helps, not just from the whole perception of, yay, you know, I'm a bestseller. That is cool. But when you are a bestseller, Amazon puts that bestseller tag next to your book in the search results. Okay. So if I search, you know, say you're a bestseller in this category and I search, you know, puppy school and your book is like number five on the results. Okay. Not number one, but number five, your book might be the only one that has that bestseller tag, which means that me as a shopper will see your book and it will stick out even though it wasn't number one. And Mm -hmm. it will make me stop, give pause, look at it and maybe click on it. And if I click on it, I just send a signal to Amazon that, hey, when people type this in, this book is the one that people stopped at and paid attention to over one, two, three, and four. And then if they buy it, then it's like, oh, well, if this happens more and more, Amazon says, hmm, this must be the, the book people want. And so they'll move you up to number one. So that bestsellers tag can really help with all of your rankings because you're going to stick out more and they're going to get more interactions with the shoppers. The second thing that happens too, is that when you do have the bestseller tag, think of it like social proof. You know, they say in like in online marketing that if you're able to show that lots of people have like this or following this or so, then it makes other people less likely to reject it kind of gives them the warm and fuzzy feeling that this is the right choice. Well, the bestseller tag is kind of that same thing. When I show up to your book sales page and I'm reading your book description, because you're a bestseller, it tells me there's clearly a lot of other people that have made the decision to buy this and it makes it easier for them to pull the trigger and buy it as well. If there's no indication that people are interacting or purchasing this, I may be less likely to do it. So the bestseller tag can really help in those two components. So that explains why my five out of 10 are about helping me to get a bestseller tag. My other five though, are because if my sales marketing, if my launch pad, all of these things that happen to help increase the sales of books, that's gonna ingratiate me inside of the right category. So if I show up in LitRPG, right? When I'm making a lot of sales, when I'm showing up there, all of a sudden I'm gonna be attached with the other ones and that'll get me in front of the right crowd, the right fans. There are a lot of people that go to LitRPG and check out the latest books there. So I want to show up for that too. So to recap on that, the bestseller five are there to help me to get the bestseller tag, which helps me to convert better and will help me to make more sales. The top five are to get me next to the books I want to be next to. So I get in front of those shoppers. And as I do my launch, my book should show up somewhere in there. And I think that will help too. So that's my rule of thumb, five and five. How often should you assess or change keywords and categories? And how can you tell if they're working? Yeah, when it comes to keywords, I think that really depends on how you feel about the book. So if your book is doing great in sales, you know, you might want to hold off on on doing that unless maybe it plateaus for a while. I have an article on how to change your keywords. If you Google that, you can find my step by step. But what I do is I tell people, hey, you have seven boxes. I recommend only changing two at a time, not all of them. Change two, by the way, copy and paste them somewhere just in case. Mm -hmm. Put in two new ones in there. And then give it three to four days to see what happens. If your sales jump up, then you just improved and you got in front of other things. If your sales drop, now you know two keyword boxes that are really helping you. So put them back in and then try another two. I love that. That's something new that I hadn't heard before. That's awesome. Yeah, this systematic approach is really important because there may be one of those seven boxes that is generating a majority of your sales. And you won't know it until you do that experiment. All of a sudden you're like, whoa, okay, clearly one of these phrases is it. Now, here's another thing to understand too about keywords. Say, for example, in one of your boxes, you put puppy school and you may say to yourself, okay, cool. And you type in puppy school into Amazon, you don't see your book. So you may be inclined to say that keyword doesn't help me. But there's a thing that Amazon does though, is is that because of puppy school, the phrase, they may have put you in another term that they've deemed close like puppy university. Now, I know that's a bad example, but you know what I'm saying? Like there's some kind of synonymous word or... They know historically that books that are about puppy school, that are fiction, do well with this other term that you didn't think of. And so they'll put you in something that you didn't list. And that term may be the one that's actually making all your sales for you. But the moment you get rid of puppy school as one of your blocks, it will remove you from that other term. So my recommendation is 
just because you're not showing up for that term does not necessarily mean that that term isn't helping you. And that's why if you do the changing of your keywords, I think it's really important to just do two at a time and monitor. Great segue for a question from Lois. She says that she searched for specific books on Amazon by their exact title or even the author name. And it doesn't show up on either one of those searches. But going to Google and doing the same search, she finds the Amazon listing. What's going on there? And you know, what can we do to make sure that that doesn't happen to our books? So like, for example, say your book is your book title is very unique, right? Like it's not like how to stop smoking, right? I mean, because there are a lot of books that will compete for that. If Amazon sees that people have been typing in the title or so, and they're not selecting that book, what Amazon will sometimes do is that they know people are searching, but they're not converting on the thing they're looking for. So they'll instead put the most popular books in the results because they're like, well, we have people going here, but they're not buying. So, but boy, this latest book by Stephen King has been selling. Let's just at least put it up there for advertisement, right? And sometimes that will drop the author down, you know, further because, you know, again, they're making that decision based off of conversions. Another thing that will happen too, that could be a possibility is sometimes, especially for a new book, especially a book who hasn't had a lot of traction, Amazon usually takes a little bit longer to index them for their title because it not only showed up on their site, but they don't have any data on it, you know, beyond nobody's been there, nobody's interacted, no reviews have been dropped, no connection to the customers that are buying it. So that can be, I would say that if you don't have your categories showing up or if there are no reviews, those are usually indications that Amazon hasn't collected enough data, but those are only a couple of the cases. I can't explain them all. I've seen a couple where I'm just like scratching my head. I was like, I, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> Is there a way to accelerate the indexing process with Amazon or things that we might do that might prevent them from indexing? That well, we watch out a for? couple... A couple of things, like if you have a launch plan, right? So as in when you go to launch your book on Amazon, having a plan on ensuring you're getting people to your book in some way, shape or form, whether that's our review team or that is a book promotion sites or all of these other things, those things help to show popularity in life at your book. And that, that gets Amazon to pay attention. Okay. So that is one important component to it. Another thing, by the way, one of the tricks, and I, I say trick here, I will make it public here because I know that you guys are all good people. I, there's like a lot of times when I'm writing on Kindlepreneur, like I have to hold back because there's good tips for people, but like spammers could get a hold of it and they could use it for wrong, you know? So one of the things I like to do is that if I have a target keyword that I truly want to rank for, like say puppy school, and I have people on my email list or people on my beta team or arc team that I know are going to go purchase it, I will, instead of sending them the link, I'll say, would you mind hunting for the book using puppy school? What happens is, and again, I only do this with the people I know are going to actually take the steps to. The first person to show up will type in puppy school and they'll, they might have to scroll two or three pages, but then they'll find me, click and purchase. The next person that comes up and types in puppy school, maybe they'll find it on the first page or second page. And so they click purchase and then it shoots over to the first page. And usually, you know, about maybe five people or so by that time you're ranking number one for it. Now this isn't hacking the system and this isn't going to break Amazon. And the reason why it won't break Amazon is because the moment that Amazon starts putting you number one for that keyword term, and you no longer have people who you've influenced to go search for it and purchase it that way. Now it's up to the actual shoppers to figure this out. So when a natural shopper shows up to Amazon, types in puppy school, okay, they're going to look at your book, which is number one, and they're going to judge if that's the kind of book they're looking for. If they are, then sweet, you're now truly going to benefit from this and you'll stay there because you continue to convert. But if say number two, which used to be the number one, is the real book or the best book for that term, then people are going to click and buy it. And then you're going to at some point drop from number one to number two and so forth until you finally naturally fit where you're supposed to be. I think this tactic of sending people through a keyword helps to get your head above the water, okay? It's the fastest way to send Amazon the signal that you should show up and then there you are. But where you end up is based off of how good you swim, okay? And how good that keyword was. So I think it's a really great tactic. If you are finding that your book, you type in your title and you don't see your book, maybe it's four or five pages later, you see it in search results. One quick way to remedy that is have a couple of people purchase it by looking for your title and that will shoot you back up there. So I can't wait to hear about some of the new features and things that you have that the newest version that just got pushed out with Publisher Rocket. Which, can you give us a little bit of an overview? I've been playing a little bit with it and I love the color coding that I'm seeing with the red, yellow, green. That really helps me a lot in some of the things that I'm searching for. 
Yeah. So one of the biggest things like you were just talking about was the red, yellow, and green system. And we used to have a lot of people who would click, you know, for analyze and rocket would then tell them how many people per month have searched for this term and what the competition score is. And a lot of people would say, well, is that good or not? And so we developed a red, yellow, green system where green is great. Yellow is and red is not really good. But even more so is we had, like I said, we've been analyzing certain keywords and there are a lot of phrases that get a lot of searches, but we have found that they don't get a lot of purchases. Okay. This is, for example, fantasy book, lots of people type that in, but from our market research, we found that not many people are actually buying on that term. So we incorporated that system inside of it. So in Publisher Rocket, you may see that this one term has a thousand searches per month, but it gets a yellow score. And this other term has 400 searches per month, but it gets a green score. And that's because we know that the 400 per month actually makes more sales than the thousand per month or whatever the number was I said. And so our system looks at that and kind of helps people to understand if this is a really good term that makes sales, or if this is just a highly sought term, but isn't a good fit. We did the same thing with the competition score as well. Sometimes the competition score may be high, but boy, that's pretty good for that term, you know? And so we've made it really easy for authors to figure out what's good and what's not. Really, it comes down to you asking yourself if that phrase that you see the numbers for is that a good fit for your book? Another big thing that we did too is we used to have a lot of suggestions and the suggestions weren't very useful. We had this way of like kind of reverse engineering the words and going backwards. Like say, for example, you typed in how to write a book. Well, it would then show all the Amazon suggestions A through Z for how to write a book, but then it would go how to write a so then you would see a whole bunch of like novel poems, manuscripts, you know, and so forth. And then we would do how to, and all of a sudden you'd see a whole bunch. And so we had way too many suggestions in situations like that. So we found a way to be even more specific in Amazon. And now we look for words that are on the left and right of the phrase you put in. And we dig a lot more inside of Amazon, but then we have a little button at the bottom where you can click to have us kind of force more to look even further. And so I think we're saving a lot more time for people by giving more specific information and mm -hmm. more particular to what their search is, but give them a quick, easy button to go even further. Those are just a couple of the things that we also added ASIN specific searches. So in case there's a particular book that you want to see, you can bring it up. And we actually have finished the programming, but I think we're releasing it in October, but we're going to be including Audible information. So now you can do Audible book searches. You can also see how many sales Audible books are making, which is pretty insane. And then on top of that too, probably a month after that, we'll be releasing the historical category data. And so for all 14,000 categories, you can click on one and you can see the sales trends in that category, which can help you to do a couple things. One, know which ones are selling better, which ones are trending better. And then also too, you can almost see if there's a dip in the year or a high point in the year, that's the best time to release that kind of book. I've also found that the fact that Publisher Rocket has this ability for me to easily, when I'm doing searches and doing AMS keyword searches, it gives me the results that I can export along with the ASINs of all of the you know matching books that came up that I've targeted with that keyword search. So I'm able to easily use that to throw it into a, a product specific ad targeting those books that are similar to or also indexed for that term that I would like to be indexed for. So I love that. I think that's that's really helpful. And I've found some keyword search tools just don't have that ability. And that's one of the things that I really like that stands out with Rocket as well. Yeah, absolutely. I see a couple of questions about Katie Spy. KD Spy is a different program. KD Spy is a Chrome plugin. They're really awesome in the fact like if you're on Amazon and you're searching and you want to quickly see like uh, how much money this book is making or so, you click the little button and it pulls it right there. One of the big differences between Publisher Rocket and KD Spy is Publisher Rocket will actually tell you how many people per month search for the term. Mm -hmm. So instead of seeing possible ideas for keywords, you actually know which keywords people are looking for. I think it's a really big difference, especially for selecting. Also too, we have the entire catalog of categories and we have ways to find categories or what categories other books are part of. Whereas with Katie Spy, on the other hand, it will only show you what categories that particular book is a part of. So right. just a couple, but it is a great little tool, especially if you're on Amazon and you want to see right then and there. If you have not checked out the Publisher Rocket tool, I don't think you'll find a better value out there. It's something that you should check out. There's a lot of great functionality for around a hundred bucks. And every time it gets better and you get more functionality, you don't have to pay for more. And so many keyword search tools out there that have the power of what 
Publisher Rocket does are charging monthly subscription fees. Dave, I love that you didn't go there and that people get a huge value when they purchase it and they get this lifetime access. That is just genius. Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of subscriptions myself. <laughs> Here's one from Pat. Is there a better day of the week to release a book or does it matter? Not from the release standpoint. I haven't seen any data that says Monday or Sunday. What I say to the author is which day is the best day for you? Because if you're planning your launch, you're going to have a lot of things that need to happen over the course of five plus days. If the best days for you is your weekend, then do it. If it's the weekday, then do it then. But I recommend not launching it and then having like the next two days where you're like full on something else and you can't get to it. Otherwise, you're really going to miss out on that, what I call the honeymoon period. Because mm -hmm. when you launch your book, Amazon does give you preferential treatment. That is the moment to strike and strike hard um, so that you can really cement yourself in Amazon's algorithm after the launch. So to answer that, it's more about your time than it is about that there's this particular day where sales rise or not. I'd like to follow up on what you were saying about the honeymoon period. When we're launching books and we're trying to figure out a launch plan, I advise people to do pre-orders for their books. I get a launch team together, a street team, you know, arc team, whatever people refer to it as, and, you know, drive lots of traffic, drive pre-orders. The one thing that I kind of myself and some of the other coaches that I've seen out there differ is when do you launch the ebook and then the print book? So in one line of thinking is get the ebook out there, you know, a couple of weeks, a week ahead, get some reviews going, and then your print books can follow a week later. But now others are saying, well, if you do that, you're kind of messing with your honeymoon period. You really need to launch them together. What do you think about that? So I think it depends on the author. If you're a new author, you don't have a large following, I don't recommend breaking up your system. Instead, I would recommend launching them both at the same time because there are certain people like myself included, I'm not much of an ebook person, especially in nonfiction. In fiction, maybe I do ebooks, but in nonfiction, I like to have the physical book and I like to take notes. So if you launch, but you're like, oh, hey, Dave, you know, I got your attention. Please come to the book. And I get there and I'm like, oh, it doesn't have, you know, a physical copy. Then you lost the sale and you're going to have to regain my attention again to bring me back to when you actually launch the kind that I want, which is a physical book. So for newer authors, I don't think that that's a very good strategy. I think that you should do the ebook and the book at the same time because you're not going to have this large, massive amount of waves of audience coming. Right now for authors who have, who've done this, or they have an email list, you know, a large email list, or they've been doing this. I do think it's great to have a reason to regain people's attention. So in this case, you have a thousand plus people under email, you have a following, you have written books, you have a great marketing plan that stretches out weeks, if not a month, instead of a couple of days. For them, it's great to have a reason to re-engage your email list when, you know, maybe you launch this, hey, the ebook is out. It's the cheapest it'll ever be. Come on and jump on it right now. Two weeks later, the book just came out. Hey guys, all you who love to hold in your hands, look at it, it's in my hands here. Jump on Amazon right now and get it. That's just another reason to re-engage with your list and bring them back to Amazon. And that's okay. So to recap on that, I think newer authors should publish them both at the same time for authors who have email lists or have concrete plans who've been doing this or so, you know, it's actually not bad to have another reason to re-engage with your list. Going yeah. back to the honeymoon period though, does Amazon have like, is it one week or so where they're giving you this extra love for the honeymoon? And then if you happen to just use that up on the ebook, you don't get a separate one for your paperback. Is that how it works? Or, you know, if you do separate them, do you not get a honeymoon period for the second book? The yeah, so three. we actually just did this year's experiment. So last year's experiment was on the seven Kindle keywords. This year's experiment was on what I call the popularity effect. And there was a tertiary one called the honeymoon period. So if you type into Google honeymoon period, Kindlepreneur, that experiment will show up. We have full on graphs showing the popularity component. Here's the thing. There is no set time for the honeymoon period. It really depends on a couple of factors. It depends on how much consistent sales you show. Okay. It also ties into the level of competitiveness in the general area you're in. So what I mean by this is that if you have 
say three or four weeks already planned with great marketing that shows that you're continuing to bring new people in and to engage and Amazon sees that, that honeymoon period will last a lot longer than the person who didn't, okay? The person who maybe had a giant surge on the first day and nothing after that. The second thing is that it also depends on the competitiveness. So if you're, say, fighting for romance novel, Okay. You're showing up for romance novels or, you know, these really, really good terms for whatever your book is, then you will have probably like a shorter fuse, if you will, a quicker time for a hook off the stage. First sign of trouble, maybe you'll get ganked first. Whereas like maybe a different area where there aren't as many books, you know, that are being introduced as new books and Amazon can give you longer and you're showing them that you're still doing good in that spot. Those are some of the ways that handle it. But yeah, like I said, check out that article. We, we built these okay. graphs to kind of quickly Wonderful. help to understand that. But I think the most important part for a launch is consistent sales and not highs and lows. I, I tell people that I believe that let's say there's two launches, launch A and B. And launch A, on day one, you sell 10,000 copies. And then for the rest of the month, you sell nothing. Or right. launch B, you sell 1,000 copies you know, consistently for 10 days. I tell you the consistent sales, even though it's less sales than the other one, is way better for the long term of your book than a giant spike. Because Amazon likes consistency. They like to see that you're showing sales, you're showing existence, you're showing popularity. And because of that, that honeymoon period will last longer than you did your time and you lost it. Tom's asking, would you recommend that during that five day or honeymoon period that gets things started doing Amazon ads to help drive more traffic? I like to add Amazon ads about two thirds of the way into my launch plan. My launch plan consists of a whole bunch of things that are sending people there you know, that, that are engaging. And when I'm starting to run out of my launch plan and all of this excitement and I'm starting to hit the fumes, you know, on the gas. That's when I'll start to add the Amazon ads in. So it re-beefs it up and it kind of maybe creates a new, shall we say, consistent level of sales. And that consistency, again, is super important. So that's just me. I've heard other people like to start it from day one, you know, and there's pros and cons to that too. So let me rephrase what I said and say, I don't know the exact answer. For that particular thing, I prefer to do the last one third of my launch plan, but I've seen other people with great success do it from day one. So okay. I can't definitively give the answer for that. Tell me all about this great new tool that's coming because you know, I'm on board. I cannot wait to get the next Kindlepreneur release. And it's specifically for writers on the writer side of things, right? Atticus? Yes, ma'am. That's correct. So, well, I used to be on Scrivener, right? And I would write on Scrivener. And then I'd export on to Word document. I'd go back and forth with my editor. And then I'd have like five or six different copies of my book that said final copy on it. And then I would upload it to Judo, which is my book formatting software. There's also Vellum. And by the end of it, so I used kind of three different softwares in order to write the book. And I end up with a whole bunch of copies. So my ultimate goal as a writer has always been to one day have one software where I get to outline, write, collaborate, and format and never have to leave it. And so that's where the idea of Atticus started. We're launching publicly here in a couple of weeks. And basically what it will be is Vellum, but better, works on all platforms and half the cost. And it also has the writing component as well. But immediately upon launch, though, we will be adding writing goals, analytics, Promodoro timers. We're also adding a whole bunch of like little fun Easter eggs inside the thing. But the point is to get writers to want to write in it. And so that's Atticus in a nutshell. You also mentioned formatting too. So you're talking about being able to export a Kindle version, a paperback version. Is that what you mean by the formatting part of it? Exactly. So just like in uh -huh. Vellum, you can actually like look at it. You'll see exactly what your book will look like on a Nook, Kindle, you know, iPad, on physical book. It takes care of all the widows and orphans. You can have it formatted with trim sizes that fit all the markets. And it's all with this really cool click of a button. And yeah, it's by far the easiest way to format a book. A number of us are children's book authors. And I know that there are others that do nonfiction that have charts and things like that. So when we have images and things within, is that going to be supported as well with regard to the formatting aspect? Yeah, images for sure. We also have full bleed image and you can also design special chapter themes as well in case you were doing that. So yeah, like I said, it was for me, I think the only answer out there was vellum for most authors, but it really didn't support a lot of nonfiction components. And on top of that too, it only worked on Mac and it was 300 bucks. So that was kind of our way that we'll start in the market is by giving all the authors PC and Mac their ability. 
And like I said, design it in a way so that authors can write, edit, and format all within the program without having to leave. For anybody, if they're looking at Atticus, you can go to atticus.io now. And if you sign up for the wait list, we'll let you know that you can jump on it in our what we call our private offering. And it's $117 in the private offering. But when we go public, it'll be $147. So, and it's a one-time cost and that includes all updates. So. Okay, that sounds wonderful. I'm in. Tell us a little more about where people can find you, follow up on information, or if they have additional questions, how should they contact you? Yeah, well, you can find me at kindlepreneur.com. I've got a contact page there. It's right there in the footer. If you have any questions, more than happy to answer them. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day. I'm glad you were here to join us. Thanks for dropping so much great knowledge and helping us get to the point where we can get our books discovered on Amazon. All right. Thank you so much, Dave. Have a wonderful day and I hope you feel better. Thanks everybody for joining us. I hope you got a lot out of this. Thanks again, everybody. Have a wonderful day.